talking about the future of virtual reality journalism. We're also going to talk about augmented reality and some other new technologies. One thing I wanted to do is get a sense in the room of who has actually put on and consumed virtual reality, maybe in a Google Cardboard. Please raise your hand if you've used Google Cardboard. Okay, keep your hand up if you've put on an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift, if you've done that. Okay, if you've worn a HoloLens, can we see that? Okay, good, that's very helpful. Okay, so I think it's important that we get a little bit understanding of specific terms. We talk about virtual reality, augmented reality. What are these things? So first, let's talk, talk about augmented reality. Augmented reality is where we take the real world and we augment or add to information. We put up computer graphics, sometimes it's with data, but we're giving you additional information into the real world, which contrasted with virtual reality is we put you into a whole new world. You put on the headset, you're totally immersed in that, and that takes you and teleports you to a new experience, a new place, but you don't see the real world, right? And so then there's this term mixed reality that kind of comes in and who even knows because Microsoft comes up with it and they start talking about it and what is that? And so we're going to talk about how these all are starting to merge and come together, okay? But inside virtual reality, one big piece here is 360 video. This uh, group has a lot of experience with 360 video and we're going to talk to them about that. And then we also want to differentiate that from what we say is computer generated or a game rendering, a live rendering environment where the user is able to move through and see a computer generated image. Um, now that's even being generated by photogrammetry and there's lots of new technologies to make that better. But we're basically just defining two, 360 video and computer generated. And we're going to talk about both of those, okay? So let's jump in, start with our panelists. the state of virtual reality and you can speak a little bit about AR too and it works in journalism. Um, yeah, well first thanks so much for having me here. I'm very excited um, to share a little bit of my points of view in this matter. Um, I think right now virtual reality journalism, I think it's in a, in a moment of a little turning point. I think we've been two years with all the excitement of like virtual reality and 360 video and news organizations uh, like AP or New York Times uh, producing a lot of content. And, and I think now we are, I think we are gonna see like how 360 video gets more in the day-to-day -day, um, workflows of a lot of newsrooms. Um, so like simple 360 videos. And then we'll see some media organizations really pushing and like putting a lot of budget for creating real experiences in virtual reality that need like a lot, much more budget, um, much more time, much more expertise. But I think we are gonna see like these two trends, mm -hmm. I'd say. So, and Steve does a lot of the actual production for both companies and journalism. So talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the state of virtual reality. Yeah, I think we're very similar to where we saw RCA in televisions 100 years ago. You, you've got the tech companies supplementing the content to meet a, a very early distribution network. Um, in, in this case, it's headsets or what that next step might be. Uh, from the nonprofit and foundation standpoint and the work that I do, they're very interested in terms of bringing their experiences of the work they do you know, to a larger audience, even if that audience is you know, manually putting headsets on, at conferences and, and uh, events. From the news work that I do, I think it's the, the, exactly what you said. We're, we're starting to experiment with it. We're starting to add, uh, you know, add this into our workflow. But like any new technology and new storytelling technique, I think the state is still in a real infancy because I don't think the news orgs have yet to really heavily invest in this type of technology the way they would invest in a social media manager or video editors or, or shooters or producers. And I know we want to make sure that this is a very practical uh, panel, so we're going to talk a little bit about gear and things um, and how you can teach this. So let's go ahead and jump into that. Um, we've seen a lot of changes in how we do 360 video. So Steve, will you talk a little bit about kind of the evolution of that and where we are yeah. today? Like two years ago, we all started <laughs> with like 3D printed GoPro duct tape rigs, essentially, and just tried to put as many cameras in as small of a space as possible and then painfully manually stitched those together and made sure all the cameras were firing at the same time. And then GoPro came out with this lovely cube that now syncs all the cameras and at least has a somewhat of a profile, but the cameras still didn't talk to each other 
And now today we have things like the Samsung and the, the Insta 361 that you know attach basically right to your your smartphone. They also can work individually. You know, we've got a little bit more advanced cameras that are gathering ambisonic audio, so essentially 360 audio. Um, so what's nice is the stitching part of this has gone completely out of the way, which is really, really advantageous. Now you basically point and shoot it like you would a regular GoPro. There's no intensive post-production to make video 360 video. And how has that affected news gathering? Um, well, for sure, I think like since we start having um, low-cost cameras, very easy to use cameras. Um, I'm, it has like generated a lot of content right away, you know, like the New York Times start with their daily 360, which basically they're using uh, Samsung cameras that they cost like $300, $400, very easy to use. Um, AP is also using these kind of cameras. And then the workflow is quicker, you know, like in, in, even like in 12, 24 hours, you can have a piece out there. So. So this changes like all these processes of like when we were like stitching and it would take like a lot of days, which we still need to do depending on the quality of the content you want to show. But for like news and for people working in like fast space, that this workflow is getting quicker and easier, it's great, no? And cheaper. <laughs> yeah. So in the education space, we were trying to make the decision, how much time do we spend teaching the technical, the, the stitching piece of it? There were, we would have workshops, and Steve would do a day and a half on just the stitching part. And you're doing it in a classroom, and you're spending weeks. Well, now that it stitches in the camera, we can spend a lot more time talking about the story and placement of the camera and understanding the narrative and how are we going to tell that and what's the best place to place this camera rather than spending so much time on, uh, on the stitching part, right? So this has been a really nice thing. And there's still option uh, parts where we do have to do some more complex stitching. But from a basic level, this is a $150 camera. Um, there's even a newer version out now, although I think this is a better one than the newer one. Um, but you, know, you can basically do this and get this for a lot of people. It's kind of similar to where we were, what we were talking about last night. The flip phone, remember the, uh, not flip phone. The, the flip cam. The flip cam, remember that when every journalist had to have a flip cam? You know, this is a similar price. We're not far off from that, and we want to make sure we stay focused on what's that story and teaching that story and letting people use it. Um, I want to give you the example of one of my uh, big mistakes. Um, first time I got it, we were doing this thing, and I'm uh, shooting a thing on campus, and all of a sudden, kind of the top basketball players at UNC were all sitting there eating lunch together, and I'm like, oh, this will be great. I'm going to get them talking on 360 video. So I take this camera. It was a bigger one than this, but I take it, and I set it on the table, like right beside the napkin holder, right? and have them talk, and they're talking, they're telling, it's great stories, they're talking about the national championship, or how they hope to get there, and all this stuff. And then I look at the video, and what happens? You are an ant on the table, looking up like this. You've gotten shrunk down, and the point of view was totally wrong, okay? That point of view did not work for that particular thing. Well, guess what? Every one of my students does the same thing. So I actually don't even tell them this story. I let them figure it out on their own and realize how bad it is to make them think about where you place the camera. So I'd love to hear kind of some of your stories of like, what are some really interesting um, point of views or locations or places you've put a camera that um, made for a unique storytelling experience? Yeah, <laughs> that's the whole thing. I mean, normally, um, I don't really like like having like already like norms or things that you can do and you cannot do. I think the medium is like really in its infancy and it's and it's really cool to experiment and see like sometimes like this point of view in the middle of the table like an ant can be interesting or it, it can add something. Um, normally we say that you have to place the camera where you are placed where where the, the head of someone would be like the head of the, the your audience in this case, so like, an adult, like normally it's like eye level, if we are sitting here, it would be like here with us probably, or like sitting with you. Um, but, but I also think we can play with actually putting the camera in places where our, it would be impossible to have our body or our head there. So to bring access to places and, th yeah, and points of view that are impossible. Let's say in a concert, um, right next to the artist, or like in the sky, or the other day with AP, they were like uh, filming athletes um, training and when they were like shooting. Mm -hmm. And so we would put the camera next to the, how do you say, like the, the place that you shoot and like it has to touch. Yeah. You wouldn't put your head there for sure, <laughs> but you can put a camera, no? Worst case, you will lose a camera. And it's a very cool point of view suddenly, no? So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think that's something we all have to really decide is, 
is this a piece of journalism or, or a video piece that we're going to do that is realistic in terms of an actual experience somebody could do, so where their head is, or are we going to use this camera to put it in a place that you actually can't access? Um, and the nice part is you can do both. You can address that in your script writing, in your graphics, uh, in the way you, you present your piece. So the one I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, because my, my poor buddy Ryan uh, had to do this shoot with me. We were on a, a, a cod fishing boat in the Arctic Circle in Norway. And it was like snowing in 15 foot seas. And he, unfortunately, was not feeling too good laying down the entire time. And we put this camera on this you know, 12 foot pole off the side of the boat so you could see these fishermen bringing in the fish. But you essentially were hovering over the Norwegian Sea in the middle of a storm. And we were actually able to fix the horizon so you weren't basically tipping with the boat to prevent motion sickness. I'll show you how to do that tomorrow in the workshop, uh, shameless, shameless plug. But it was great. It was, it was an angle that nobody else would able to, you wouldn't be able to shoot that angle with any conventional camera and give that sort of perspective. And, and that part is just really exciting with this technology that, that we can show people you know, what it would be like from that vantage point that just would be impossible to film any otherwise. And one other thing about shooting 360 video is where do you go? Where should the photographer be? Where is the producer in this case? And so there's lots of different scenarios here. And one of the things that I think our group agrees on is that there's no right answer all the time, right? And so it depends on the story and what are you trying to do. And most of the stuff I do, it's typically more documentary film style. And we try to get out of the scene. So I actually went to and um, I was doing a project in the Galapagos with these sea turtles. And, or sorry, actually, they, they were tortoises. Um, but they were like in the middle of open field and there was no place for me to hide. So I had gone to an army navy store and I got a ghillie suit and I like laid there in the field. You can't find me, right? Like maybe I did it for fun, but maybe it was the right thing to do in that case. Whereas Steve was doing a lot of work for the Weather Channel, so why don't you tell us about what your decisions have been? Yeah, that. so we, uh, two years ago, we did uh, one of the first on-camera 360 pieces where we brought a climate scientist into a glacier to explain how they melt from the inside out. And immediately after the higher-ups saw that, I got a FedEx package the next day of that lovely blue Weather Channel jacket because <laughs> we realized there was no way in some scenarios for me to be out of the shot. And we had to just acknowledge that in our products and say, well, this is Steve Johnson, new correspondent journalist for the Weather Channel. Um, and of course, it's still fun to wear that blue jacket and mess with people on a random day and you know, ask them what's going on. But we really had to address it. We, when you produce a 360 piece, you have to address if you're in the piece or if you're out of the piece. And if you're in it, that's totally fine. You're a journalist. We're, we're in the piece all the time in broadcast work. You just should address why you're there. Otherwise, your audience is just going to be kind of like, oh, why, why is that guy with a notebook just awkwardly standing in all of the scenes kind of looking at the camera to make sure it hasn't been stolen? Yeah. So. So, Claudia, can you talk about interviews and kind of what do you do in an interview situation? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on the story and like, and like how, but I would say beyond this, what I, what I um, think it's interesting to think is also like what does this mean to journalism, no? Because we were used to, so in many cases you have to agree something with your character, like okay, I'm gonna leave and now you're gonna, this is gonna happen. And we were not supposed to do this in journalism, no? So it's fine, it doesn't mean that, that it's fake what's going to happen, but how, how we address this, no? And how, um, what's the shift in journalism? No? I just like put this into the air to think about it. I think it's about being transparent. What are we trying to do? What are we accomplishing? Why are we doing it this way? And if you're going to be in the scene, then make sure the viewer knows why you're in the scene, right? And so, um, so let's try to um, move on a little bit. What's really hard in VR, specifically 360 video for now? Um, what is hard in VR journalism, Claudia? In terms of workflow or? It can be workflow, it can be if your frustrations, you, you can just, this could be therapy session if you want it to uh, be. Great. great, thank you. <laughs> the bar open. <laughs> I was waiting for this moment okay. actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think um, the tendency in journalism, for sure we need to create workflows that are easy and quick and that, that we can like implement inside the newsroom. So it's difficult to keep this balance between innovating all the time, no? Uh, so for me what sucks in a way is that, um, more and more, like I see that we are repeating like formulas to do videos, which is important to do it, but at the same time you are like repeating all the time like the same kind of story or like the same time of type of script. So um, not a lot of variety in the work that we're showing. Yeah, okay. exactly. And um, yeah, and then it's difficult to implement new changes, no? Because if like let's say for example, AP, like 
working there is very difficult to like, oh, now we want to try this new camera, no? And many people that has already been using a camera or like that we already had like a type of workflow that was working, it's very difficult to change that, no? So it's hard to get journalists to change, is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. So go ahead, uh, Steve. Uh, what sucks? Well, some of my pieces from two years ago, definitely, yeah. um, <laughs> when, we were, when we were figuring this out. Um, I think my biggest frustration right now is um, luckily getting solved quickly is distribution. Um, mm. We have had to rely on, you know, literal pieces of cardboard and smartphones and, you know, just the other month I was doing a workshop at GW and I asked a group of 10 very qualified faculty members to, all right, everybody, pull up YouTube, pull up our playlist of our examples and we'll start and passed out 10 headsets and it took 30 minutes because you have to install the YouTube app and then hit the cardboard button and then put it in quickly and then hope your headphones are on. And, and the good thing is standalone 360 and, and VR headsets actually were just released two weeks ago. Um, you know, Oculus and Samsung and Google Daydream, um, HTC are all working on these sub $200, $250 headsets that basically have the phone built in. So distribution is starting to get, get fixed, but I, I think the main frustration that I'm finding is um, you know, if you walked into a newsroom 10 or 15 years ago, you had the print operation and, you know, web was kind of up here. And now today you have the web operation and now print is kind of up here. And I don't think that we are open to trying these new story technologies seriously. You know, we're seeing this with very low day rates with news orgs just from a business side, but also the cameras are cheap enough to now where we're just, we'll give it to a reporter and they'll shoot some 360 video and we'll edit it and put it online. We did that with flip cameras seven years ago, eight years ago before the iPhones were really high quality. We're not really investing in the quality of storytelling and in a way we're training our audiences to see bad 360 video and, and we have an opportunity with a totally new platform to showcase our best work and I think in some instances it's, it's kind of an afterthought in terms of the quality of storytelling. Uh, which, which luckily the tech is getting quickly pushed aside and we can focus so much more on the journalistic aspects of it and where we place the camera, but right now it still kind of sucks a little bit. All right, so where are things going? Um, well, he's, men he's mentioned the, the cost of headsets are coming down. If you think of an Oculus as $400 plus at least a $1,000 um, computer to run it, uh, the Vive is a little bit more and that's where you're getting these great immersive experiences. But now we've seen these announcements of $200 or less um, standalone headsets that are supposed to be doing a lot of this. They're coming kind of early next year. That, I think, is going to have a significant impact. Um, what are some of the other things that you guys are seeing in the future, even maybe in content or how we tell stories? You want to start? <laughs> oh, I, I, all after you. Um, well, um, I think... I don't know, I think it's going to be very exciting in the next two, three years to see where is this going exactly, no? I think maybe also we'll start seeing more like stories focus it to a certain audience, so, so breaking from mainstream audience and mainstream journalists, I mean we've seen that already with the web, but I think with virtual reality uh, journalists it's even more important, no? Because there are stories that for someone that experience will be very important to live and to understand and go through this virtual reality experience to get the story and some other people don't really will need <laughs> to experience that maybe, you know? So I guess maybe, um, hopefully in terms of distribution it will be easier to like put it on a headset and like that everything works quickly and it's not like now. Um, but also I think conceptually we'll start maybe like um, fragmenting more like with, to who we are directing that piece and why. I think the ability, you know, in no other period in, in communications have we let our audience completely control the perspective. I mean, even cave paintings, we made the animals bigger that we killed than our stick figures because it was more impressive. And I think what's exciting is virtual reality and journalism and photorealistic virtual environments, meaning 360 video then moving into VR, allows our audience a level of transparency that has never been seen before in journalism. Um, we no longer have to argue over crowd sizes at inaugurations because you can walk around yourself and look around yourself because as photographers we can kind of lie with perspective. So I'm very hopeful for that and then also just from the business side of journalism, I'm very hopeful that this is a new platform. Um, I hope we're smart about this and charge for it. 
I hope as uh, Netflix just charged me more money a month to watch 4K content, I hope we charge more money a month to use this platform and we make it good enough that people want to pay for it instead of just throwing it into the free thing that Facebook controls. And that, that very much frustrates me not to get back into the yeah. sucks part again. Yeah. But I think the future of this is really bright. We've got some amazingly talented experimenters in the academic space. We've got some amazingly talented journalists boots on the ground every day that are creating high quality content. Now we have to really get the publishers on board to say invest in this, but also be firm and don't drop this paywall just because you think something is cool. Yeah. Um, I think the future is very bright in this. I think the tech companies are helping us out with this, and I think audiences are responding very fast to these updates uh, for the types of stories we tell, but also the technology that's needed to, to get it out there. And I have the dream job of running an emerging technologies lab in the journalism school. So I get to figure out what, is, what are we going to be doing? What's the new things that are coming? And one of the things we try to do is solve problems. So one of the problems is how do we do a nice moving shot that's smooth and doesn't make people sick? So I'll introduce you to our robot here. Yay. So this is a virtual reality robot that is remote controlled or can also, be, um, can also follow a reporter. So imagine you can take them to a big event, the state fair or whatever, and it will follow them around and giving the perspective of an individual where they're in the headset and they can turn and look around. We can live stream it. We can put any 360 head on here. So we've put uh, Steve's uh, 3D 360 head on this, which is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, we've also added a few things where it won't run over kids because the first generation ran over my boys. Um, they're so, okay. They're, they're yeah, fine. Yeah, they're okay. <laughs> um, but this is uh, Ducille. We built it in the, the lab at UNC, and we get to do a lot of fun stuff playing with it. But it's all about the production and solving the problem. So imagine you're creating a nice high-end, strong production where you want a nice, smooth, moving shot. We can do that. So the producer can come in here and say, I want it to move at this particular speed and go straight and it will just do a nice, straight, smooth shot, and then it will stop and, and go. So we get to play a lot of things with a lot of new toys and, and kind of figuring out what's the next new thing uh, to do that. So I think you're going to see some robots coming. It's not going to be for there for every story, and uh, hopefully they'll get smaller than what you see there. Um, this one is exactly 100 pounds with the case, so you can put it on a plane, barely. Um, but uh, it's, it's an experiment that we've been working on and we're using it in our uh, productions to try to make it better. So. I think it's exciting because the walk and talk shot that is so famous in broadcast works mm -hmm. so well. You know, when you're walking from the West Wing to the residence doing an interview and normally those are, as we know in broadcast, kind of staged. You know, yeah. it's, oh, we need the walk and talk shot. To be able to go walk with you know, the head White House correspondent and the chief of staff or and the president. That's, that's a phenomenal piece of technology. And does it have a name? Yes. So for our Washington Post friends in the room and great photojournalist, uh, Michael Ducille, his name is Ducille, the rep robot, um, was named after Michael Ducille, who died covering Ebola um, and was just a great photojournalist. And the idea being that he went places that people didn't want to go, and maybe this robot can do, do the same. So we named it Ducille. So Good thanks for asking. Yeah. So, all right, so we've been talking a lot about VR, but let's not forget about AR, okay? Um, adding things to the, the world. This is something we're doing a lot in our, la our lab. Some really interesting things is um, you have AR kit uh, from Apple, and then Android has released theirs recently, um, and which allows, if you have a student with some basic um, computer knowledge, they can get in and develop and build AR apps for tablets and for phones, which are really nice. And you can start to experiment with what that means. And we talked a lot about data and visualizations. Can we bring data in? Can we take the geolocation of where you are, take data that we might have from public sources, put those together, and then visualize that in your augmented reality experience? So that's one step. But I think the, the kind of next step to that is, you know, you've seen Google Glass. This is the, um, the HoloLens. So it is a um, experience where. I get to see movies, or I can stand up so you can see. Um, I get to see windows in the screen in real life. So I can see you, I can do this, and I get the kind of the menu that you see there on the right. 
um, and I'm able to interact with content. You look a little funny wearing this and, and doing, doing things like this, um, but this is getting smaller and, and uh, you're gonna see it eventually in glasses and I think the long term is can they make it a contact um, that you'll see. I'm not sure if that's five years away or 10 years away, but I think the glass is getting much smaller is gonna have a major effect on this. So we built a, an app in our lab that scrapes LinkedIn data. We got in trouble for that. Um, but uh, what it does is it, I could look around the room, I could see all of your faces and I could search LinkedIn and it would put a little bubble over your head of what your name is and who you work for. And then I can click again and get your LinkedIn profile. Um, so uh, it's a neat thing, imagine as a journalist, you're, you go to cover the town council meeting and everyone you see, you know, oh, that's the person I need to interview, right? So we're thinking about how do we apply these technologies for journalism? And then also how do we apply these to the world out there? So, I'm a big fan of this. It's really a little bit heavy and cumbersome, takes a little bit to get used to, um, but as they get smaller, I think you'll see a lot more of them. Problem right now is they're hard to get and they're $3,000 a piece, so it's not really for the mass audience yet. So, but I think AR is a, a storytelling place where, um, where we need to be looking forward and I think it's something that's going to take over and actually surpass virtual reality. Um, there's an analogy I use that one's not gonna be dominate the other, they're gonna be used differently. So if you think about when you use Netflix or your Amazon Prime and you sit down and you binge watch, you get in the dark room and you kinda of sit down and you just watch for hours, right? It's a, a conscious decision to immerse yourself into that story. That's where your virtual reality is gonna be used. Augmented reality is how many times do you check your phone in a day? All that contextual information will just be smart and presented to you and so you'll probably use augmented reality much more often over and over and over throughout the day, just like you do your phone, right? So it's not that one's going to beat the other, it's just we're gonna use them differently. And then as journalists, we have to figure out how do we tell stories in both, right? So anybody want anything on AR or? I think you did a great. Okay, Somebody. these guys do a lot more on the VR <laughs> side, so I, I took that one a little bit. So <laughs> I wanna open this up to you guys. I'm sure uh, you have questions. We've left a lot of time for this because we know that you guys have questions. You can ask about teaching it, about Technology, whatever you want, so please, uh, we want to open this up uh, to you guys. While we wait for someone to come to the so mic. The oh, okay, there's Brooke. Great. Okay. <laughs> so, Brooke. Okay. Hi, I'm Brooke Van Dam from Georgetown. I have a question, which to me is the sort of obvious one uh, the ethical implications of this technology and privacy. So, I wonder if you all have an opinion on. Specifically about virtual reality or augmented reality? Right, so in 360 video, now so, so normally if you're filming something, I'm a mm -hmm. photojournalist, you sort of um, would maybe ask permission or people are very aware that I am filming you. Now if you put a 360 camera in the middle, say of this room, everyone's being filmed mm -hmm. and they might not know it. I mean, your camera yeah. was sitting in the corner. And nobody and I, knew. Yeah. Nobody knew and now all of a sudden I'm in the middle of a, of a news report that yeah. I didn't yeah. want to be in front of. And then as you said, yeah. with the, um, the, the data that you were, was it illegally obtaining, Stephen? It was against the terms of service. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I just wonder with AR, you know, how, how you're accessing people's information and they might not know it. So, right. so what, are, what are sort of yeah, the so, ethical implications so, for privacy? Well, and, and do journalists have a responsibility to respect that privacy that some people might want? Claudia, do you have a um, Sure, no, no, we think a lot about that with 360 video because we are placing these cameras that are almost like surveillance cameras uh, that many people don't recognize that yet. So they, are, they cannot give actively permission because they don't know it's a camera for sure. Um, I think as journalists, I mean, you have to be aware where you are and what you're filming. Uh, who is the people like getting uh, filmed? Like let's say in television, we have always filmed B-roll uh, on the streets and we haven't asked permission for that. Uh, so like depending for the use that, that you're gonna have or like if it's like people, uh, like children or, or people that you can suspect that maybe they won't be really happy to be filmed in, in certain demonstrations. Um, so I, like the ethical implications for sure are huge and I think we have to think about that. I think for sure there is no one answer uh, but I think we have to like push that each journalist, when it's using these technologies, like thinks about it, no? Because maybe not everything is written yet, but you have like to consider um, what's going on. Or even I had one case once interviewing someone in this in this mode of being uh, myself hiding, so I didn't know what the person was explaining, and she got really really intimate. 
and she started explaining things that maybe if, if I would have been there with the crew, she wouldn't have been told all these intimate things, no? So our choice, even if it was like not to release it, would have had like a lot of clicks. Our choice was to not release that, no? Because like the person didn't also know what mm -hmm. exactly was doing, we didn't know. So all these ethical choices, I think like we have to uh, promote that they are constantly done and checked and talk in the newsrooms and, no? I agree with Claudia, especially editors, 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 and teachers in this room. Mm -hmm. is, you know, we, we seek permission when we're featuring someone. Uh, when you're filming, you want to make sure that this is in a public and open area and that it is aware, you know. Uh, it's the same rules that we would, we would have in photojournalism, but it is a really powerful tool. You're starting to see uh, police organizations use this in protest situations because they can see every single person in every direction. Um, and so I think this is something we need to educate not only our practitioners, us out in the field, but our editors to say, to be able to, when, when a journalist comes back with some phenomenally great footage for an editor to be able to say, okay, does this meet our organization's ethical standards towards running footage of people? Is this a public place? Is this a private place? Is there a perception of privacy in this place? Because 360 definitely pushes, pushes yeah. those boundaries. I think we try to follow the set standards, right? What have we done in the past with other media? Um, and then apply those to the... Yeah. To the new I actually look to model. drones a lot in that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, you know when you're in a public space and a private space and drones do are able to get a camera to a place that normally people wouldn't know or you wouldn't be able to get it to. Right. And, and that's been kind of the basis. So try to apply the same rules, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, sir. Hello. Um, so you guys have talked a little bit about sort of the, the flaws that are in virtual reality currently, but there seems to be something a little bit more long-term in that virtual reality is reality encompassing. And so different from augmented reality where I can be walking down the street and sort of pull up quartz and pull up their 3D representation of the satellite that launched. In virtual reality, the ability to consume news through that is much, much more difficult to come by in just a regular day-to-day -day experience. Sure. Do you see um, that do you see overcoming that in some way? And if so, how? So I think the idea of um, if I'm going to put on my headset in my home and try to consume news, it better be really good, right? Like I'm thinking some of the documentary stuff that like Vice is doing, that might be a really interesting way of like if they did that in 360, those are the kind of things I want to consume. I don't want to see the network news anchor in a 360 thing that just doesn't do anything for me, right? Like there's no, there's no added value there, right? And so like what is that? And so I think news is trying to figure out what that is. An interesting thing, um, people who have been viewing, um, viewing a lot of uh, natural disaster stuff in this, uh, you know, the, the studies show you get more empathy. Well, what does it mean if I watch hours of network television like I always have and now I'm already showing a lot of empathy and maybe some depression about watching this natural disaster that happened. Now you put me in a fully immersive environment where I'm hearing it and I feel like I'm there. What is that effect gonna have on people, right? Like, I think it could have a strong effect and a helpful effect, but it could also be a little bit uh, scary and we wanna be conscious of that, right? So is there great news content out there? Yes. Is it easy to find and put it into a specific place where it's like, oh, here's your news, it's not really there. Um, you had a good idea of what you thought the future, you mentioned the voice part about. Yeah, I think what the future entails is we, we need better voice recognition. Uh, like I mentioned, the steps to put the headset on and how difficult that was. You know, I would much rather a system where you put on a standalone headset and you just say, show me that piece from the Associated Press uh, from Puerto Rico. And it, sh and it starts. Uh, and we need machine learning for that. We need, to, we need to organize and categorize our pieces of journalism incredibly well and better than humans can do it. And, and right now, uh, for those of you who are at Amy Webb's talk at ONA, you, you heard about the future of machine learning. We're not doing it in news orgs and that's up to the publishers and the back end folks. So when you go film in Peru, every scene that you film is a computer is analyzing what's in it, who's in it, was it indoors, was it outdoors, what time of day it was, what was the location. So when, you know, you put your headset on at home, you can say, oh, what was that piece last month from that uh, mining town in Peru that was having a conflict? 
Because that's how we think, that's how we search, and, and to be able to pull up that piece. And that's what we're building in the Emerging Technologies Lab at UNC. We're really working with uh, IBM Watson to be able to develop a lot of those pieces. Sounds good. All right, well, we'll move on. We'll have maybe some more time for questions. But I wanted to give uh, the panel here a chance to say, what are your must-sees? Okay? And the ones you sent me right before didn't get into the slides, but we can okay. still talk about them, and we can tweet <laughs> them out. Um, we've linked these out. We intentionally are not going to show them on the screen because that's not really filling this immersion. So we're going to give you a screenshot of it, but we're not actually going to show you on the screen. You need to go and consume them. So go to your library and get on t into a, uh, a headset. Figure out a way to do that so that you can uh, see this. So um, one that was, uh, that was brought up by the group. Um, who brought this one? You, no. Um, your, your favorite. Go ahead and talk us about this one. This is, um, and actually, I wouldn't want to hear how you filmed this, too. So, um, This was one the New York Times did as part of their Daily 360. And all they did, and this shows how simple this piece was to make, they attached a 360 camera onto the side of this gentleman's wheelchair and asked him to go in the New York City subway. And how difficult it is for someone who is in a wheelchair or disabled to use the subway. And he talks about how you know, people, when the elevator's broken, someone tried to help carry his wheelchair up while holding a hot cup of coffee. <laughs> and it's very emotional, and it, it's a very simple piece. It was one audio interview, and then one shot that they just cut up into scenes uh, from moving through it. And I think it's a great example of place-based storytelling, where you consider your audience a, a character and the, to better understand what, what is happening or what might be to someone that they might not relate to, to use this as a tool for you to relate to another audience. So, and my Twitter feed should have tweeted out these, so you should have these. So, um, another one that was brought up was uh, six by nine. This is a computer generated version. It's a fully immersive where it was, you know, you can move through it. Um, it's not just 360 video, but you can move through it. Um, it puts you in what it feels like to be in a six by nine solitary confinement cell. Um, this has been a great one in my class to get people talking, to get students to talk about. They pull it off and they're like, whoa. They know what it feels like, right? And so that's been a great one uh, to use for computer generated stuff. So that's uh, six by nine from The Guardian. Um, another one that I really liked was We Wait uh, by the BBC. Um, this one, notice that the, um, the, the people are the low polygon. We said it's a simple polygon, a low polygon uh, CGI environment. There's not a lot of facial features. Their eyes move a little bit, their heads move, but it's not like what we'd say photorealistic. This was intentional. They kept it very simple. They let the audio of these people carry on, and they wrote this script that pieced together a lot of interviews that they had done to let you see what it's like to wait to be an immigrant going across, waiting for a, um, a smuggler to bring you across uh, the ocean. So um, it really was it's a powerful thing. I don't want to give too much away, because um, I think it was one that my, uh, I had this like lump in my throat. Uh, through the end of it, so can you talk about your yeah um, very very quickly yeah. so um, well the, the ones I chose were like the displaced, which was the first piece that the New York Times released that probably most of you have seen, but I think it's a relevant piece because um, it's beautifully shot, it's really well made um, it gives hints of how um, narration in three sixty actually has gone, like if you watch this piece and you consider it was released a year ago and then you see other pieces, you see that they set up like some, some clues on how to like create storytelling. And the other one, well, I chose one that I worked on. Okay. That's good. <laughs> but, but also, so we were filming in Harvey um, for AP and, and then after in, in Florida uh, during Irma. And, I mean, 360 is a great tool to, like, to portray climate disasters, no? and like to show, to show like the, the what's going on all around you, no? like that, with that. So to see the amount of destruction, um, there are several pieces. Um, there is one that maybe I would recommend called um, "After Harvey: The Pain of Going Home," and basically it's when people uh, came back to to check their houses, and in that case also we were we were checking their houses at the same time they were arriving. So it was a very emotional moment, but it was also, for them, it was also a kind of a healing moment to like explain to someone what, what was that location that now was destroyed or still covered by water and, and which I think with 360 we have to think in these terms, no? like what location we are going and what time, no? like timing will be also like very relevant. And last but not least, uh, the other piece I always like showing, it's one about, 
I think if you Google um, Outis in 360 or virtual reality, it's a very simple piece. And Say basic again, what is it? Outis. Outis. Autism. Oh, autism. Like, autism. 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 Sorry. Yes. No, it's okay. Thanks, no, thanks no for problem. checking. No, no. Autism in virtual reality. It's important that you get it. Autism in 360. And basically, you are a, you are a small kid uh, with autism. Um, and the camera is placed in a way that you feel like that kid and your mother is talking to you and you start feeling the effects of more or less what uh, someone with autism or a kid with autism can feel. And it's in this line of like putting people in other shoes. Um, but that was a very simple video. Like, very, like the, the script is really simple, but it gets, you no know, like you really get it, no? Like you don't have to like go to further explanation, mm -hmm. so. That's good. I also wanted to talk about teaching and how do we teach this. So at the University of North Carolina, I had a class that used to be called uh, Storytelling and Mobile Apps. And then it became a VR class. And then I'm like, well, we can't keep changing this title of this class every single year. So now we've called it Emerging Technologies. And so now we're teaching AR and VR. And next semester, who knows what I'm going to be teaching. But the idea that it gives us a chance to do this. So um, we bring students I promoted in all the other schools, so computer science, uh, English, art. I want students from lots of different disciplines to come and join. Uh, I group them into groups of five for the entire semester. They do some individual projects, but they're constantly for the whole semester working through the idea of what type of project, what story do they want to tell in virtual reality or augmented reality together. So there's at least one computer science student on it, uh, typically someone who's more of graphically inclined, and then the others are just kind of whatever it ends up being. Sometimes they're journalism students or history majors, whatever. Um, and we build this thing, and it's been really interesting to see what they come up with. Some of them are not necessarily um, uh, what we would say traditional journalism. I try to get them into nonfiction storytelling. It's kind of where we try to keep it limited to, so we say nonfiction storytelling. Um, but they've come up with some ideas that you know we would never come up with in our lab um, because you had that many different groups of students working together. Um, so it's it's been a fun it's a fun class. My favorite one to teach. I feel like it's like trying to give a TED talk every week because it keeps changing and you got to update. And it's like all this stuff is changing, but all these resources are online. So Unity is one of the the tools that we build these computer generated worlds in. And Unity, you could make what you're seeing on the screen right now in Unity fairly quickly. You can kind of purchase or download assets to work with. Um, and basically in one class, I have students making a scene that in virtual reality with the control pad, you can move around, okay? So those resources are out there online. It's pretty quick to, to pick up and they can start making these VR scenes. Now, I will say that I get sick trying to grade them, um, but they, they start to work and as the semester goes on, they learn how to make it better, how to make it better, and then by the end of the semester, I'm not getting sick grading them. So, um, so it's been really interesting. And I wanted to give you an example of what one of the students did or two groups. One group um, was wanting to do something about police violence. And so they went out and started shooting 360 video. They shot one from the police officer's perspective. And then what they did was they asked one of the African American students to go and drive and like represent and be the, the person getting pulled over. And through the process of shooting, they realized that they didn't know enough to actually execute this well. They, A, had to like talk, and they were telling this African American student what to do, and they realized, wait, this is wrong, like this is not, like I don't know. And they realized that ethically they couldn't pull this off. And even though their project failed, it was the best learning experience of anybody in the, in the thing. Because what they realized was putting this immersive situation, they had to make a lot of choices. And they controlled, controlled the situation, they were having to tell them what to do, and there was all these things, and it was just a bad, a bad idea, right? And they got to that, and it was really, and the thing was, they were doing it with a real police officer, right there with them and the, they kind of like had to deal with this with them. So that was a really great learning experience. And then we've had some that are you know, not, as, uh, not as controversial, um, you know, creating an art museum where you see these traditional art, art pieces. So Salvador Dali's uh, The Desert Time, I forgot what it is again. Anyway, you jump into this famous thing and you're in the 3D world and they kind of took their own artistic impression of what's that 3D world? I'm really impressed in like a semester these students are building these environments when they had no previous experience in computer generated stuff. So it's doable, you can pull it together and it's been a lot of fun to, to do that. So I would say don't be afraid, jump in, find places to put it in your own class. Um, host workshops, Maryland has done some workshops with Steve um, and other schools you've worked with. Yep. Right? Kind of do yeah. a two day workshop um, as a supplement to the curriculum. So. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, I want to give a final word. So if there's anything you want to say about journalism, virtual reality, augmented reality, where we're going, the future, um, this is your chance. 
Um, related to the, to the teaching advice, um, I would recommend that whatever you do, you, you try to like, get students to do the whole process, because sometimes we are like filming, but then we don't edit. Like, try to, that, to have the whole process of creating a story. Uh, so film, edit, and then watch it together and analyze it, because sometimes we get lost in that. Um, but my final word would be, uh, basically, I think 360 video itself is a great tool um, for more like transparency in journalism and, and portraying different, creating new types of stories because it, it makes you think differently about space and like how people relate in those spaces. So it shifts the way you, you think after, you, after using the technology. And, and yeah, just uh, keep tuned because it's, it's a very exciting time and it's really cool to jump in and I think Journalists have to be at the forefront because like this is a change also for society So we have to understand what's going on to also explain it well and, and see its implications because maybe there are implications that we don't really like <laughs> and and it's it's important that journalists are, are aware and connected to this, all these technological changes Steve? Uh, Take it seriously really um, We have missed the mark as journalists on virtually every piece of technology for the last 25 years <laughs> We have. Craigslist, the internet, mobile, apps, social. We have every single one of them. And we're about to miss it with machine learning and augmented reality if we don't jump into it. So take it seriously. Um, the universities I've worked with have been phenomenal. Actually, my Maryland students, if you're in the room, raise your hand and wave. Everybody Ooh. give them jobs. Um, <laughs> they're in the process of doing four individual feature stories right now. And, and it's the 360 video is in. Raphael, like three, four classes at Maryland right now. Um, Josh is here, Bethany's here, they all incorporate it. Um, take it really seriously. Because place-based storytelling is not going away. Whether it's 360, whether it's AR, whether it's VR, telling a story with your audience as the perspective controlling it isn't going away. And if you look at the sheer billions of dollars being invested in this across the nine major tech companies across the world, the big five in the US, or the big six, let's not get left behind again because we've already lost control of our distribution platform entirely. So let's make sure there's a way we still build a business model behind this. So take it really seriously and have a lot of fun with it. You can do some really cool things with this. The stories that, that all three of us have been able to tell in this are things that we would have never been able to do with our budgets or with our creativity or time until this technology came out. So um, thank you all for your time. That's great. That's what I would say. So uh, Steve and I work together a lot, and we take each other's words, I guess. So that's perfect. So um, we're here for the, for the weekend. Uh, tomorrow is a 360 workshop, uh, if you want to join that. Um, uh, so we'll break if you some have things. questions, we're excited about this medium. We're happy to talk to you about it. But thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you, Steve, Stephen, Claudia, and of course, Christine.